Hello and welcome back to OT the Podcast. We are here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I'm Andy Green. I'm Archduke Felix Schultz III. <laughs> Chesterfield uh, of the North. Wow. A Felix. A little, ma- little mash reference there, Andy Green. <laughs> God, we're off to a cracking start. <laughs> Professional we've as got, always. Yeah, we've got some stuff to talk about, Felix. What are we talking about, Andy? All righty. Well, we're talking like to- going somewhere with this. We're talking. We're talking to a Scotsman, uh, Neil Ferrier from Discommon. Oh, Neil Ferrier from Discommon. He's not living in Scotland, though, is he? No, no, no. He's in. Uh, I think North Carolina is where we where we found him. Yeah, long way from home. We've we've liked some things. You've got a bit of news to talk about. Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's more an apology for a lack of news. Like you, like we sort of uh, did some planning before this, and you're like, Felix, you got any news? I'm like, no. I've been busy uh, on on the old at the time of recording on the old deadlines. Mm, uh, what's the, happening? Well, the uh, November issue of Revolution Australia, Revolution number fourteen, is Coming going up. off going off to the printers. So by the time you've heard this, hopefully it's it's all you know been bundled away and on its shipping container heading towards the sunny Australian shores. So. Because obviously you're the Australian editor. Of, executive uh, editor. Uh, I'm the Australian executive, executive editor. Uh, so, yeah, putting that all together, which is a, a fun juggling act. There's some some cool new watches that that are coming out, some good stories about some some vintage stuff. And, yeah, it should be Does a, executive mean you get a car park, like a car space? A corner office. Executive. I've got a yeah, corner, corner office, office in my home office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's I've just been I've I've been under the under the sort of the the pump looking at PDFs and doing all that sort of stuff. So not really up with the current affairs, but I have found time to read an article. I agree. Uh huh. What do you think of when you think of Switzerland specifically in a geopolitical sense? Uh, I think of uh, neutrality, train perhaps? lines, train lines, train I think lines. Train lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Swiss are famously neutral. They don't get involved in wars. They're not part of the EU. Uh, all that sort of jazz. They, um, mm-hmm. you know, they have for, for hundreds of years. Uh, this article on ninety nine percent invisible, uh, which is usually a podcast, but also a website, apparently, goes a little bit further into the fact that they're neutral. Doesn't mean they're not prepared. They're ready to go. I'm going to read the opening line of this article because it's what hooked me in. Reports in 2014 that explosives had finally been removed from a bridge on the Swiss-German border came as a surprise to some, mostly those who hadn't realised it had been wired to blow in the first place. (laughs) So the article is called Self-Sabotage, the Strange Swiss History of Rigging Vital Infrastructure to Explode. (laughs) Um, And it's, it's pretty hectic, but it makes sense. It's about how Switzerland makes sure that just because they're neutral doesn't mean they're not prepared if it should kick off. Of course they are. Other other exceptional gems from the article uh, include the fact that in the 90s, the Department of Defence was in charge of over 30,000 defensive structures and objects, not including the country's <laughs> numerous bunkers. So there's... Yeah, you wouldn't include Andy, those. Andy, I showed this account. to you. No, obviously not. They're not defensive structures. When they're talking <laughs> about defensive structures... There's a video in there that you should, I would highly recommend you look yeah, at. Yeah, watch it. It's like got little Swiss chalets that you go past, then they roll open the door and there's cannons in there. Actual <laughs> um, cannons. There's like little cow sheds in fields that turn out to be mortars. It's it's pretty wild. Then there's bits like There's where, rotating buildings as well and like mountains that open up to reveal more like anti-aircraft guns. Yeah, so and the whole place like it's it's really interesting. So I, I kind of knew about the the sort of, you know, the fact that they don't have runways so they have to, you know, scramble jets on highways and stuff every so often. Um but there's also stuff about how they build it into new buildings like train stations and bridges and stuff that you should be able to demolish it quickly. And they also have like defensive design around, you know, maybe they'll pop a little machine gun emplacement on the side. Um, also, I didn't realize this. So apparently, uh, Switzerland has enough bunker space to house the country's entire population with a 10% buffer. So if World War Three happens, you know where the Swiss are? Underground, deep, underground. deep underground. <laughs> 
How big is the Swiss population? I'm not sure, but probably like Australia. Probably, I don't know. That is remarkable, isn't it? I'm Googling it. I'm Googling it. Hey, Google, what is the population of Switzerland? 8.57 million. Okay, so much smaller. It's like the, what's, yeah, half of London. Wow. But still, enough bunkers for 8.5. Anyway, that's just nuts. So just think about that next time we're in Geneva, that underneath the Pal Expo is probably, I don't know, a couple of tanks. Question. Do you think that there's a bunker in uh, Rolex headquarters? There's got to be, right? <laughs> I don't want to comment on that. There's got to be. I don't want to comment on that for fear of How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, cracking. Amazing. Uh, that, it's, a, it's a good, there's some good footage in there. All right, link it up, link it up. Yeah, yeah 100%. Andy, what have you been like to? Have you been into any sort of um, civil defense initiatives? <laughs> no. Uh, mine is an artist or designer, Chris Labrui. I hope I said that right. Labrui, uh, I would have said. Labrui, he's a Scotsman as well. Sure. Um, I believe he's, he, he creates these really cool sort of scenes, uh, these digital art scenes that really defy the laws of gravity nature, everything you expect to be real. But he loves a lot of stuff with like virtual car constructions. So okay. it would be like a pool full of, uh, you know, old 911s and like lots of bright colours, lots of really kind of interesting um, things done, like statues made out of uh, cars. He, you know, might split them in half. He might have, you know, a Porsche vertically standing um, like a palm um- tree. Oh yeah, I'm just looking at these, and I've seen some of these before. He's done. He's got like some 911s with flamingos coming out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's made them like inflatable, like flamingo, like pool toys. As you do. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. He does, and it's all CGI, and he kind of, you, it's it's effectively like CGI sculpt sculptures. But he's worked with Porsche. He's worked with Apple, Nike, Jag. Um, he's done stuff with like McDonald's, Ted Baker, Target, everywhere. Um, yeah, but cool. it's a really cool account to follow on Insta, and I think like Type Seven who we, we've talked about a little bit, often post his stuff because it's really interesting. It's really uh, yeah. like bright and colourful. Uh, he does have a print shop as well. So, you know, you can pick up one of his like 911 in, turbo in the pool prints or, uh, you know, a uh, you know the Flamingo Splash, which is the 911 Flamingo, I guess, objects. And they're about 130 pounds, so like 250 bucks. But I think it's a cool, nice. um, pretty affordable for prints, I must say. Like if you want to get something that's sort of interesting and, and pretty unique and you know, car inspired, but not you know OTT. Uh, well, they've just very uh, very cool. They've just copped a follow from me on the old gram, which we'll link up. Uh, I feel like it would be up your alley. I, f- I knew yeah, you'd like yeah, this. I like some pop colors and you know Palm Springs vibes. Sort of that Miami sunset feel that I really <laughs> yeah, go just for. like a just like our stickers are for flippers uh, yeah, decals yeah. that people can buy. We'll link those up too. Nice. Before we talk about uh, another Scotsman, Andy, we should have a little quick break. We'll be back. Today's episode sponsor is Nomos Glasute, which is very cool as it's a brand both Felix and I have a lot of time for. Oof, bad puns. Love them. But um, uh, And it's particularly exciting because they've partnered with us on the launch of the brand new Nomos Lambda in steel. Boom. That's really cool, Andy. Yeah. Traditionally, the Lambda's been a special precious metal watch within the Nomos lineup. Yeah. Not anymore. Yeah. No, I think it's been around since 2015. Uh, I remember seeing... It at my second Basel World, Andy. I was very excited. It was um, very different for the brand at the time, and uh, very special. It was only only gold, and you know, really cool. Yeah. So as I mentioned, it only existed in white gold or rose gold, mm. uh, but it's famous for its unusual dial with this oversized yet very precise power reserve at the top. Uh, the name lambda is a lambda. Sorry, is a mathematical term which uh, to nomos stands for precise legibility and precision timekeeping. That's a that's a really sort of nomos naming convention as well. It's like let's bring maths into it. Um, but, mm. but these steel watches, they've released them for a reason. So they're they're limited edition, um, and they are celebrating the one hundred seven the one hundred and seventy fifth anniversary of watchmaking in the town of Glasuta. Uh, and I think a watch is a great way to celebrate that sort of occasion. So if you're not familiar with uh, small watchmaking towns in Germany, which, you know, that's okay, <laughs> um, Glasut is on right on the eastern sort of end. There's not a lot there. It's sort of close to Dresden. Um, but in 1845, a gentleman by the name of Ferdinand Adolf Langer, who, you know, went on to well, also founded another famous German watchmaking <laughs> brand, um, 
brought watchmaking to that town. It was traditionally a mining town and he sort of you know, revolutionised the industry and watchmaking today is still really important to, to Glass Hutto and there's a lot of brands there and Nomos is there in the old trade station, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So with the new this new edition is limited to 175 pieces of uh, three different dials, white, black, and blue. Mm. Uh, and it's cool to see Nomos celebrate sort of watchmaking in the region as to, you know, a personal milestone. And it's quite a, uh, a personalised sort of, you know, traditional piece of watchmaking that's really, really, I think, appropriate for the occasion. Do you want to know some other details, Andy? I would love to know the, the details, Felix. One of the other interesting ones, so steel case, also slightly smaller case, 40.5 mil down from 42, and I believe a smidge thinner. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a highly polished steel case, and it's got a really sort of domed crystal, giving it a really a dressy look overall. Um, but as we've sort of alluded to, the movement is really in many ways the star of the show. It's the DUW-1001, which has 84 hours of power reserve on that big power reserve indicator. How many days is that, Andy, off the top of your head? 3.5 days off the top of my head, which means bi-weekly winding, here we come. Yeah, that's if you've got a manually winding watch, that's what you want. Um, it's also just a beautiful movement. Like it's a big three-quarter main plate, which is really, a, you know, traditional German watchmaking is all about. It's got a, a sort of a, a sunray finish in a, what they call Nomos Perlage, beautiful sort of arrangement of um, – uh, rubies it looks it's gorgeous to look mm. at like even though it's not you know although the gears aren't on display it's still you know it's a lovely looking you know case back uh but the the real star i think on the movement side is the hand engraved balance cock andy are you ready for me to try my hand at year seven german go for it the balance cock reads mit liebe im glashute gefickt you understood that right okay oh. Yeah, I'll give you a 10 out of 10. Uh, that translates to lovingly produced in glass ute. Yeah, so it's I think it's it's really, really beautiful. But the dial, as we've you know said, there's white, there's blue, there's black. It's got the small seconds at the bottom, uh, that massive power reserve that I think is really cool and the you know regular sort of hours and minutes. For me, it reminds me of a, a regulator dial sort of style, and it's you know, again, that you know, traditional pocket watch vibe. Um, yeah. How have you found it, Andy? Yes. So we haven't mentioned, I've actually had the watch for a little while now under secret, secret embargo. It's on the wrist. It is lovely. It Mm -hmm. is light. It's comfortable. It wears well. It's a a smaller case and it is a little bit thinner, about 0.1 than those precious metal options we've talked about. Mm. The strap's delightful. I love the winged clasp, which is just like a classy touch to the, to the whole watch overall. The movement, as we've talked about a lot, is a treat. Like, I'll, there'll be some photos all over the internet by now, and I'll link some up if you can't find them. Yeah, sure. It is just so nice to look at. I think that's a really overlooked touch on on watches often because the clasp is where you sort of you put it on, you take it off. That's what you 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 mm. deal with. And if it's a, a a poorly designed clasp, it's gonna it's gonna you know impact how you feel about it. So this one's a winner in your eyes. It's a win. It feels luxe. It does. It just feels. It feels classy. It just feels high end. Extra points for the packaging. I won't go on too much about it. But the long wallet that comes with every Nomos that you get. Mm. These little buckles that hold the strap flat in place. It doesn't move around. You don't have to worry about zippers. It's. It is just a great touch. It's classy. Felix, my question to you: Who's it for? This is a really good question. I think there's a few people that that would appreciate this. Like, it's high end watchmaking in stainless steel, which isn't something you get too often especially at the price that we're sort of talking about which you know we'll get to in a second um for me i think there's two people that this is sort of really well you know in the wheelhouse for the first is that sort of your your super hard nomos collector that maybe Mm -hmm. has you know loved nomos and you know have has a, a watch box full of them and they want something to sort of to be the pinnacle of it that sort of represents the best of what Nomos's watchmakers are, are capable of. And I think for the movement, this is certainly very special in their assortment. But even if you've never seen a, a Nomos before, you could look at this watch and it would be really well suited for someone in a more sort of a professional setting, uh, someone that wears a suit or, you know, sort of shirt, maybe a, maybe an architect, maybe someone um, that doesn't want to have that, you know, the same sort of watch as everyone else, but really appreciates quality. 
and good design. Mm. Oh and yeah, really well, good we, design. And I, yeah, and I think Felix, that's why the steel is important, right? Yeah, I think there's there's sort of for me there's a few reasons why the steel is really key. Um, and we've we've said it, you know, we've alluded to it. Price price does matter. I mean, uh, you know, it's not precious metal. It shaves a, a little bit off there. Um, also, it's sort of um, uh it's a perception thing. Like not everyone wants to have a, mm. a rose gold watch or, you know, feels comfortable wearing that every day. And partially that's because steel is so much more hard wearing. Uh, you know, you can sort of, you know, knock it around a little bit. You don't have to worry about those sort of scratches that you can get on a gold watch. And that's, that's, I think a, a big part of that, you know, this is an everyday sort of piece. Uh, but also some people aren't into gold because they, you know, they don't necessarily feel comfortable wearing that, or it's not, you know, their their daily vibe. For me, I think this this steel case turns the lambda from a, a special occasion piece into an everyday one, and I think that's great. One hundred percent. It's a really discerning and discreet mm-hmm. watch, and especially in that sort of smaller case size, which is mm-hmm. just. Yeah, spot on. So the price, Felix, which we've danced around for the last eight minutes. Tangoed. Tangoed. <laughs> What's a German German waltz or something? A waltz, yeah, we've waltzed around. Ten thousand, yeah, we've waltzed around the price. Ten thousand four hundred Australian dollars. Nice. Fifty eight hundred euros or Great British pounds. Nice. And seventy five hundred United States dollars. Wow. Well, um, look, I think we've talked enough about uh, the new Lambda in steel. If you want to find out more about it, please visit nomos glasuta dot com. That's nomos dash g l a s h u-e-t-t-e dot com to see the new steel lambda for yourself it's time to talk to neil ferrier what a guy. chief conspirator owner of discommon concepts discommon goods uh custom design agency that does really really crazy wild stuff yep if yep. you caught our episode with jacoby uh and struther from iris listen well you'll you'll know the connection there neil neil ferrier and his um his agency did those headphones he's he's been on our radar, and we've you know we've caught up with him a few times, you know, at the Basel Worlds yeah, of yesteryear. Run into him and had an expensive coffee. He's always very very excited. He's always uh, he's a very energetic man. He sort of worked at Oakley back in the day, and and before kind of going out on his own, he's done stuff with coffee tables. He's yeah, done wild, stuff with cars. Like stealth bomber coffee tables. That's what I think. You know, I started going, "Who is this guy? What's going on there?" Yeah, really really cool. He's done stuff in watches as well. Oh, um, he's yeah. he's he's. he's fiddled around there but yep. he's just one of those guys that's just always doing really really cool things and he's a treat to talk to so without further ado ado let's get him on felix and a today's guest mm-hmm. is neil ferrier chief conspirator at discommon is that what, is that what uh, neil's business card says chief conspirator that's what, that's what his linkedin says okay all right okay I have a LinkedIn. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the podcast, Chief Conspiracy Neil gonna, Yeah, I'm just going to endorse you for conspiracy. Uh, Neil, welcome to the show. How are you going? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, Andy, it's been like a number of years. It's, it's, a uh, years, yeah. it's um, great fun always to chat to you. Yeah, last time I think it was sipping very expensive coffee uh, in Basel. It was yes, um, the good old sort of nine dollar Starbucks, right? Will be the <laughs> is is normally the that's the anything anything in Switzerland that involves coffee um, is expensive. I think these yeah. were Nespresso pods served at the hall for yeah, but about nine bucks. So yeah, yeah probably money. still still the same amount of money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. mental. So Neil, we met through your business, Discommon, and when I just when I think I've figured out what Discommon is and what it does it completely shifts and something changes and you just blow my mind with a whole new product or service offering. But who are you and what is Discommon? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I think the the <laughs> easiest way to, I thought it was a very nice compliment that, that I keep you on your toes. I think that's what I aim to do. Uh, Discommon, we are an industrial design firm, um, but we are essentially a companyification of of my ADD and and my uh, adoration for new and different challenges so um, what what works away in the background all the time is the fact that we are doing industrial design engineering and sometimes actually even manufacturing work for clients uh, most of them never on our Instagram most of them not named on our website um, and been very fortunate most of them have come from either word of mouth or, or doing good work 
uh, but but we are an ID firm for them. Uh, but I promised the freelancers and my employees that we would uh, never get stale. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a, a packaging company just designs packaging. Uh, you know, a, a, a bottle design company in the drinks industry um, just designs bottles, and I never uh, wanted that to happen. So. Um, this common goods and just this common as a let's call it a disruptor in design uh, came about from the fact that actually uh, I couldn't I couldn't afford marketing when we started the company. So I said to my original business partner Jeremy, let's just you know let's make stuff. Um, uh, and I, I think I probably had like four or five thousand dollars at the time, and um, we we struck about developing our first little thing, which was the watch wallet, and then just. It went from there uh, to just now, if there's an idea for something and I love it, we all just kind of gang together and figure out how to make it real. It doesn't always need a fantastic business case. Sometimes we just want to create it. Amazing, amazing. And so I, I remember the, the watch uh, wallet very well. It was probably six or seven years ago. Uh, really interesting product and you've stayed kind of in that watch space uh you know, you've been, you've kept a, you've kept a toe in in that pool. But curious to hear about your background before launching your own business. Um, I believe you're at Oakley, and sort of that's where you cut your teeth in the sort of industrial designy sort of space. Uh yes, I'm, I'm actually a mechanical engineer by degree, and I have no right to. I try to never call myself an industrial designer because if you stuck me with a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper, um, it, it would not be nearly as exciting as our normal output is. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, you know, you jokingly mentioned chief conspirator before. Uh, uh-huh. I, I, that really is what I, I do now, is is essentially uh, poke and prod and provoke the guys that, that, that design for this common. Um, and I sort of shape and mold the things that they are working on into how I envision them being. Um, and with Kevin, my head designer, we've we've found one of these things that you couldn't really predict. It's just uh, we are a duo now. Um, it's you know just weirdly works. It's it's like a marriage of two working people. Um, but you, you mentioned before that um, you're right. It was Oakley straight out of university, and I went there to work in the research and development team with mm-hmm. an engineering degree. And I, I was very fortunate. I had a boss called Carlos Reyes, who was the vice president at Oakley. And I was a kid, you know, I was 22 when I went there. Um, and I was with a lot of people more experienced than me. Um, and I had pleaded for the deep end and they definitely gave me that option to sink or swim. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first project I got put on was a military project for a U.S. Special Forces group. And um, I don't think I ever cried, but I, I mean, I was, you know, <laughs> I was working. It was... It was definitely work, and it was it was intimidating and it was nerve wracking um, to be dumped in at the deep end. But I did, you know, I survived, and uh, the group I worked with eventually became Advanced Product Development. And our our mo was to disappear off around the world and learn new technologies and how to um, essentially mass manufacture with them. Hmm. Uh, so how how to make something real, and you know, if you start that at twenty two, you just think that's normal. Um, it, it it wasn't looking back on it, but to be given carte blanche to, you know, we Oakley had a line of sunglasses called X Metal, and it was a factory in Salt, well, just in Utah, basically. Um, I forget the name of the town now, but just outside of Salt Lake City in Utah, and uh, they used to be the Lynx Golf Club factory, um, and Jim Gennard, the owner of Oakley, bought it and decided he would start using their golf club head casting process of titanium to try and make sunglasses. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did, but we decided that we would do X metal 2.0. This is back in probably 2012, 2013. And I got sent off around the world to learn how to do MIM, which is called metal injection molding. And it's actually how, um, a lot of watch companies use. So any ceramic watches, um, that's CIM ceramic injection molding. Um, and a lot of uh, other companies are moving towards some of the more advanced like ceramic cases for Panerai and some of the bezels and stuff like that are all done with metal injection molding. We were about eight years ago, probably, um, we were molding uh, sunglass parts around the world with that. And I had to go to like 
like military universities in China to you know that were at the forefront of this, all the way to you know a factory in Boulder, Colorado that makes every single one of Remington's steel metal mm. injection molded trigger components. Uh, sure. So, uh, baptism by fire. When you were at um at Oakley, I, I could be imagining this, but did you have anything to do with? Was it? I can't remember what it was called, but it was a really cool little watch pouch. It's like a little sort of hockey puck shaped thing. No, but I I will tell you that I've knocked it off. Um, yeah, it's one of I knew. I that knew that. No, it's one of the things I'm least proud of and most proud of because so the Oakley watch puck was like such a wasted product. Mm. Um, <laughs> it was made in China. You know, it was probably it cost about four dollars to make. It's thermoformed EVA molded foam um, with a material over the top of it. And I use it day in, day out now. It's incredible. That process. Uh, sorry, the, the puck, but I use the process for yep. things that we manufacture day in, day out. For mm-hmm. um, Iris, our headphones client that we'll talk about later, their headphones case, we use it. We use it for a medical firm. Anyway, th- this puck was like just something that I adored as I started to get into watches. Um, and it's somewhat a cult item in the watch yeah. space. Um, and nobody's ever really remade it or done it nicely because it's either done incredibly cheaply um, in China where you just get a knockoff version of it. Yeah. But you can do the same process with incredible leather, leathers and foams and Japanese microfibers and stuff like that. The problem is it costs probably somewhere in the region of a nine to $14,000 tool to, to form this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got the one that we made, which was, you know, calf skin and, and yeah, Japanese micro suede in it and stuff. I have one prototype of, and the company came back to us and said, no problem. Minimum order quantity is 150,000. Oh, <laughs> so it just got parked in one go. And, and the yeah. Oakley piece remains a collector item. You know? um, well, there you go. So I mean, that's, that's, that's a good backstory. I was, I, I sort of thought it might've sort of predated you, but it was, Almost too stolen, they did, I, it pre- stolen IP. Yeah, it predated my watch collecting as well. And when my watch collecting started, that was you know an immediate thing. Like, oh my goodness, I need to collect as many of these as I can. Yeah, sure. You got a little stash. It's one thing you're you you're really good at, Neil, and then the disc crew is really good at is making me want things and realize I I want things that I really don't need, um, like expensive watch rolls. Or, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very, very fancy and expensive flasks that potentially also have rockets in them. <laughs> okay, well, this is this is so, Andy. This is a, this is this is nature um, in a sense. Yeah. You know that I have been so fortunate to piece together the means around me to make things that are stuck in my head. Well, mm. I like old watches. I like cars. I like motorcycles. I like whiskey you have a number of those vices tucked away in the back of your mind. So if I accidentally make something in that realm, there's a pretty high percentage chance you're going to sit there and go, gosh, that looks like it could have come out of my head. You know, so I'm, I'm running a, I'm running a percentages game here. You know, if I mm. love the idea of it and there's a reasonable chance that somebody else is going to be struck by the same vice when I make it real. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love it because I, I, part, and Back to you. Part of me thinks that a lot of the work that you do is uh, it's really just you finding a way to build things that you like and monetize it so that you can pay for it. Um, and, and put ah, well, there is a key. <laughs> well, there's a key. Uh, there's a key issue there, though. Um, I don't monetize it very well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, everybody looks at these things, and yes, they're expensive. But uh, we we released a duffel bag this holiday, and my assistant, I probably should have fired her for this, ran the numbers on it. And I am eighteen and a half thousand dollars into developing a duffel bag, and it, like if you want to do the profit loss on something, that's a lot of duffel bags. Let's say we, you know, if I speak transparently, that duffel bag is going to cost. We're we're making it in the U.S. It's probably going to cost three hundred dollars, you know, in yeah. sewing um, and materials. So let's say we try and keep it in a realm where we can sell this to you know people without being Prada or Gucci, right? I don't want to sell a two and a half thousand dollar duffel bag. So let's say we get keep it at eight hundred dollars, mm-hmm. um, and that would obviously end up including shipping. We're going to have to do a really nice box for it, all that kind of stuff. Somebody's going to ask to wholesale it. I won't bother you with all the details, but the reality is, I probably have to get through about two hundred and fifty duffel bags before it's even like a oh great project. And have you have you factored in the fact that you've been working on this duffel bag for like six years? I don't want to know that. Um, <laughs> 
Bill but, that, so, be Abilie, right? <laughs> how, however, <laughs> the joy of having completed it and the fact that we have asserted that we can do that does have monetary value for me because yeah. And we can sit in a client meeting with somebody like Toomey and just say, hey, listen, we've we've cut our teeth on this stuff before. Mm. You know, I understand how to make this. And the reality is, you know, if you work with a client and take 4% of revenue on something or you offer to manufacture it for them, the design that you do, then the money tucks itself away in the background and your absurd duffel development wasn't so stupid anymore. But I, I am always very transparent with the fact that if anybody got to see the Discommon Goods bank account, <laughs> I would be like, somebody would put me in an insane asylum. I mean, it's, it's comical. You know, <laughs> we, we, we launch something and it sells 200 and that's really exciting and there's $45,000 in the bank account. And then I'm like, cool, new project. <laughs> About six weeks later, there's, you know, $1,700 yeah. left in there. Uh, so it <laughs> It couldn't. It, it, uh, and a serious point on this, it, it gives me a lot of tension, pain, anguish, concern for a lot of the people that I see when they decide to ripcord from a safe nine to five mm. because they have an invention and they want to launch it. Um, because it's hard, and and I was really it wasn't it wasn't skill or being smart. I just happened to start two things at the same time uh, where I was doing consulting and we we're making this product, um, and. And it was essentially our advertising. But, you know, guys who I see start whatever you want to call it, multi-tool companies or accessory companies or all the wonderful, wonderful makers on, on Instagram that create these low volume things. If there's not a secondary company, you know, man, you got to work. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's real life. You know, selling 50 incredible straight razors isn't paying your mortgage. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's an economy of scale, as they say. I've got a, a quick sort of um, uh, question I want to sort of circle back to. This old duffel bag that you've mentioned, Andy said it took how many years to develop? Eight? Was it? Are you, I'll give you the story of the duffel bag. I don't mind. I think we're about Tell five us. years in, five or six. Um, Why? So we, I'll get, well, do you want the abridged? I'll try and give you the two-minute version. So um, yeah. I designed it with my friend Kyle, who is the head of accessories at Oakley. Mm -hmm. um we designed a sort of automotive inspired one kyle was my baptism on yo uh this doesn't just exist in 3d cad like a machined cup where you just go and make it afterwards we need to make some samples we decided first that we would try and do this in a really price point affordable way um and we worked with a factory in taiwan to do it with some really cool fabrics and stuff like that the factory got bought and then disappeared so that was like one year off <laughs> it was gone um, um, I had a moment in there where one of the samples, I was in Denver air, no, sorry, Dallas airport. Um, and I was carrying one of the samples. I was stress testing it and the strap tore out of the bag with a full load swung down an escalator and took out a five-year-old boy and knocked oh. him to the ground. <laughs> um, so the to factor in. So, <laughs> don't, don't tell so, any potential backers that. <laughs> No, no, no. Well, that was that was Taiwan sample number one. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, I said, right, I'm not doing this in Asia anymore. <laughs> At which point in time, Shinola came along and uh, asked us if they could buy the design for that duffel bag. And I said, okay. well, you can't really just buy the design and walk away. We'll design for you. We want. I'll do a collab, or we want to design with you. You're one of the largest sort of you know neo American luxury like Shinola's mm -hmm, a big mm -hmm. brand now in the US and they, they went for it I thought oh, great they'll go for it so we then developed the design obviously tweaked and changed and then I worked with my designer Raj um, who's in London on making it more I don't know let's call it shinola but still trying to push them a little bit so then mm -hmm. we started working with US suppliers on that and um, I think I'm long enough away from the contract now that it doesn't really matter but at one point in time their uh, creative director after about a year and three months, production ready samples, wicked bag just walked in one day and was like, I just don't think this is right for our brand anymore. And then the project cool, was killed. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, um, so yeah. I went back to them and said, Well, if it's not right for your brand, I want the designs. And they said, Well, we paid you for the designs. And I said, Well, I don't, I'll pay you back. I don't know. <laughs> I, I would just like to use them. Um, you know, we've made these phenomenal bags. And if it's not right for your brand, then you can't say that they're competitive. 
you know, so Ooh, nice. I'm not going to be competition to you. And they said, okay, take them. And they didn't even make us pay for them. And I left. Uh, oh. This was incredibly amicable with, with Chinola. That's good. You know, the, the story and the process of it was humorous. Um, but I still know some of their team extremely well. And, and uh, the whole thing was a fantastic experience going back and forth to Detroit, other than not making the bags. So now I'm stuck in no man's land and I had some kind of Shinola design bags. I had some kind of Kyle design <laughs> bags. And, and I was like, well, I have a lot of bags, but now I still don't know where to make them. So then I had to ask Shinola, I'm going to just continue on with one of your factories. Is that okay? That was a whole process. Anyway, now we're making it with a company called Korchmar, who are the oldest briefcase manufacturer in America. They're a brand, but they're also a manufacturer. Um, and... Um, I literally, there's a production sample in FedEx right now um, on its way to be. So that's oh, how you burn some time. <laughs> very, very exciting. I, right? Or also in the middle of it all doing real work, you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> Just getting distracted by this. So that's, um, and it, 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 so that's, you know, I, we'll expect to see it in another three to four years, maybe? or Three years, yep. I think that's yeah. a good marker. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, so I'll was... decide that. I'll decide the hardware is not nice when it comes this week or something or that I want to redesign it or that all needs to be black. And even though we've manufactured 500 sets of it, I'll have to start over, you know? Yep. So um, spring, we'll spring, sure spring to... summer 2027. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be sure to link up whatever details you can give us for pre, pre, pre-orders uh, on those, oh. those ba- bag boys. The, the worst part is that one of my friends has nicknamed it the Disco Duffel, and it seems to have actually stuck. And I, I might, <laughs> I might end up calling it that for no reason other than I like the fact that he called it a Disco Duffel. I like it. I like it. Well, you've uh, alluded to this a couple of times now, but we recently had one of your clients uh, on the show. Uh, he had some terrible Iris, things to say about you, Iris. Listen, well, so you were bet. late. You you slept in on meetings. Um, <laughs> but tell us about uh, the team at Iris and what you've you've kind of been doing for for those guys well i should first of all admit i hope at least uh, jacoby gave me somewhat hell on the podcast but just for everybody who does listen to this i did sleep through the podcast um i was on a vacation and i saw the calendar invite um from from andy uh and i saw 9 p.m but of course that was 9 p.m australia time um and i i peacefully slept through the whole podcast so <laughs> neil it's okay apologize for that gents i have done Other the same people thing do it all the time and i'm yeah. in the same city <laughs> <laughs> and it's your so, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jacoby came to me through a mutual friend in the watch world who I, I'm not going to say his name, just just I haven't asked him if he minds, but a uh, fantastic guy in the watch world. Um, Andy, you actually know him quite well. Uh, but okay. he, uh, Jacoby had, he'll have given you the background on this audio tech. You know, it, it's a fairly fantastic, fantastical sounding story. And I was, you know, I had it all pitched to me and, and our mutual friend said that uh, he'd had some design work done by a large agency in the US uh, and it was uh, sort of beyond minimal and verging on lazy. Um, and Oof. I stopped listening as soon as I heard big design firm and they didn't do good work and I immediately knew I was going to do the project because I'm quite competitive. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I was a wee bit bummed to be the cleanup crew, you know, not the, not the first choice. <laughs> but um, I, I will say that we did manage to get, uh, we started completely from scratch with Jacoby and it, it ended up, I have just loved working with them because it has been a complete adventure. They had, you know, the, they and we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, one of one of Jacoby's finer, um, I'm going to give him just a little bit of crap now and he, and he won't mind this, but one of his finer statements to me as we were going through the design concepts was, oh, well, I love that one. I love how modern it is, but I want it to be retro. So like keep the modern, <laughs> but make it retro. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> to which, that's just sort of, yeah, I was, um, we went through a lot of concepts, and um, but it was a, it was a great exercise. I actually never really got frustrating because it was really really fun to get to explore in very thorough depth. You know, headphones design, um, and, and I will say before that, one of my first meetings with Jacoby was um, in a meeting in Los Angeles. I flew out for it, um, and he brought the Iris Tech on a set of Bose headphones. It all been kind of hokey together a little bit, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. This is going to be like my first, whatever you know, pyramid scheme or vaporware or something. You know, <laughs> that I'm just going to think is comical. 
and I and he and he turned it on and he just sat back and I think he like pulled up his phone and started looking at his text as I listened to a, a, a song on it. And my only reaction when I took him off was, "Oh shit! All right, <laughs> I guess we're in." <laughs> I got to do some work now. <laughs> now. Now I'm actually gonna have to do this. Uh, so it's been great. And because, you know, product development was new to them, I had mentioned at some point in time, you know, when we finished design, I said, guys, I don't really want to just hand this over to you and leave you to this. You know, we're, we're quite good at China. Um, with Oakley, I'd spent an awful lot of time there and I've done a lot of product development in the consumer electronics space. Can, can you retain us, please, throughout this? And they looked as if I'd offered a, a gift. And we immediately went into a retainer relationship where we mm. became part of the development team with them. And it allowed me, you know, their team grew quickly during the process of this. And they, you know, very quickly had people that were good at Asia and, and, and business team. And, you know, the company grew. Mm. But at, at the beginning of this, it was really fun because we got to do the China trips. And I got to sort of educate them on how juggernaut factories in Asia work. And mm. and I think I was somewhat useful in explaining the whole process to it and, and giving the team in Asia a pretty good beating of what we would expect to come out of this quality wise. So that was a real treat um, and allowed us to be part of the process up until, you know, we're still doing stuff with them just now. So you've, you've sort of, um, you've, uh, alternately been very praising and, and maybe, you know, actually, no, you've just been praising, uh, the, the Iris team. And that makes me sort of wonder from a, from a design perspective, like you sort of hear the horror stories of, you know, terrible design clients what makes a whereas it sounds like this is the polar opposite like where you want to get more involved and you want to have that ongoing relationship what makes a really good client from that sort of design point of view well look, i'll back up and say iris were a total shit show for us okay. at some point. Okay. sorry <laughs> I, I, I wasn't it. quite sure i was understanding so, that correctly no, but, <laughs> but um but they they, they were and, and they would admit it's because they were a startup you know and and they would sort of things would arbitrarily change or there would be you know there would be goals set and all of a sudden it would spin around to be something else or um you know they have the a phenomenal deal now with red bull uh formula one team and you know the 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 monthly retainer rate that we had with them versus the amount of renders that needed to be done to appease Red Bull and kind of get them in the door and stuff was was verging on comical in relation to the amount of work that we were doing versus um, you know let's sure. call it just covering the hours. But the good thing is when you're suckered in on a product, we just ate some of that. You know, it just didn't. There was no point in making it become a thing or a big mm. deal or something that needed to be talked about week in week out. Um, I learned a lot from it. I certainly would probably approach things, some things differently, but a good client, I think, is one that doesn't just bring you in to be a mule. Like, they they don't just bring you in to do what they say, because mm -hmm. why on earth would you, why on earth would you pick an experienced team unless you wanted genuine collaboration. And there have been points in time where um, uh, we, I mean, we cocked up some things for, for, for Iris as well. You know, we, I tried to help them out with something in the early stages of the, the F1 stuff where we were trying to get some plastic pieces made for uh, the comms headphones for the F1 team. And, you know, because of my enthusiasm for this kind of stuff, I said, we'll help you get this done. We'll get it 3D printed. They'll be great. And they weren't great. Um, and that was just sort of my enthusiasm for the client and what they're doing or getting suckered into things. And you know what? We should have stayed in our lane um, mm. and we should have just done what we're good at. But but yeah, I think a good client is, you know, mutual respect, but also receiving of our kind of critique and analysis of things. Um, but I think we're quite a good I hope we're quite a good partner in these things because we only ever maintain three or four clients at one time. Yeah, um, you're right. We're a small team. Uh, and funnily enough, I've even toyed. Um, on the surface of explaining this, it's going to sound, possibly could sound egotistical and it's not meant to, and I'll explain why. But we've toyed with the idea of stating that we only accept four clients at one time and that the client has to interview with us as to whether they want to work with us. That's the egotistical same, 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 sounding, same. egotistical part of it, in a sense. However, what that means is on the counter side of that is if we all agree to this, you have us. 
Like mm. that means you have me at any point in time. That means you have our contacts, our manufacturing in Asia. It means you have the three D printers when you need them, or the obscure, you know, midnight hail marys with the manufacturer trying to fix stuff and things like that. You don't just have a design firm that outputs PDFs. Um, yeah. And that's an idea we still toy with, and it would be a lot of money a year for somebody to have it. But then you basically, arguably, brought in I don't know five employees into your company, whilst only mm. actually all you did was commit to a contract for a year. Yeah, yeah okay, that's really cool. For the people that haven't seen these headphones yet, I've watched a really cool video, and it looks like the contract has gone really well because it's a video of you Neil flying around in helicopters <laughs> and sports cars. Yeah. And- Tossing duffels aside, and uh, side note that yeah. was on our that was on our dime. Just just FYI, that was, uh, that was a trip to California. That imagine um, if you had five clients. That's all I want to know. <laughs> yeah, that was a trip to California that um, Iris uh, wanted Important to business. film on, which was clever. <laughs> Said uh, startup um, startup hustle mentality. <laughs> Take it in a helicopter yeah, recently. <laughs> That's why there's a thousand dollars in the bank. There's a lot of people every now and then, but I have used it now and then to go from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara and it saves nine hours of my day. And, and if you want to compare that to like actually achieving something on a business trip or not achieving it, I have actually spent that money once. Uh, I've done it three times now where if you could just remove Los Angeles traffic and I can spend three hours with our machine shop that basically makes you know, I don't know, a, a notable percentage of our revenue. Man, the, mm-hmm. yeah, the helicopter throws people or they think it's some like Instagram thing or I'm trying to pimp the helicopter company Look, or something. You, know, you, can have a, you can have a helicopter, just don't keep it at the house. Keep it there. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. You... <laughs> Hang it off side. Have known, I luckily have known the pilot for a long time and I'm pretty sure what he charges me is about the price of gas. So I'm, I'm fortunate <laughs> well, that's, that that's, it's still a flex to be able to just go, yeah. well, it, it, makes, it makes sense to take the helicopter Shopper option. Flex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, but, funny, as an engineer um i i do approach things in fairly obscure ways sometimes and um i think i think it's a, quite an american thing to try and maximize income or maximize your money um and i would far far rather do things easier um, and have a little bit more of a quality of life or um some of my soul still remaining uh, and I and I quite often, you know, we have a lot of freelancers doing stuff for us, and it's so much more, um, I don't know, so much better for your soul to delegate, uh, and and I guess you earn less, but but the, you know, you, you come out. Mm. I'm not often a shell of a human. That's that's yeah, important. Okay. Well, before you started flexing your helicopter on us, I was mm. going to ask you what these headphones <laughs> actually look like, because in that in that video, you do sort of mention the goal of the design and. Uh, what you wanted people to think and see when they saw someone wearing these headphones and, and I guess the whole branding side of things. So I'd love to hear you know, your quick take on the actual design yeah, of these I tell headphones. You, I tell you, it was, it was crippling. It was extremely hard. Um, this was not an easy process for us. And some of the stuff that we loved didn't work with the IRS guys. Some of the stuff that they loved, I just said, I'm sorry, I just can't get my... I mentioned soul earlier. I can't get my my soul around this, guys. I really don't want to do this one. It's not right. Um, And here was what I was trying to balance. Uh, It's very easy to do, uh, let's call it like a Lamborghini track car of something. So wings and winglets and crazy matte black and pops of, you know, Mm. color all over and, and something that screams. And... Uh, it, so it would be very easy to do aggressive headphones um, or ones that I would say would get the moniker badass. But then if you try to do classy or minimal or clean or uh, I could use the word smooth headphones, it's very easy for them to become vanilla. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden they just become you know circles or ovals or something like that. Yeah. So this, this was our challenge. I didn't want to do the Lamborghini Evo Stradale to track beast, you know. Uh, but I also refused to do something that, uh, well, I think I mentioned in that video, my goal was if you walked onto an airplane, well, you can catch a pair of beats because they're, um, and I, a pair of beats is to me defined by two things. It's uh, primary color, usually, or, or white. Mm-hmm. 
and it has a very large B logo on it, and they've kept everything circular and clean and simple. So if you go down that road, you're immediately going to be confused by being something that looks like these. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want somebody to have the 10, 12, 15 foot ability to think, oh, I wonder what that is. Well, mm. if straight off the bat, it so to, to achieve that means you do need to make it distinctive. Uh, and I wanted to make it distinctive without shouting. So we got into this theme of having trying to make it look multi-layered. Um, and one of the main inspirations we ended up on was the robot from iRobot, the Will Smith movie. Oh, um, cool. And it's a humanized robot, right? It's got that white glowing face. Uh, but th that glow shows you the substructure. And I said, I really want to expose some of the substructure of this for people who want to study it. Uh, and that's what we did with it. You know, on the surface, at first glance, it's quite a clean white or black headphone. If you spend a little time with it, when the iris is on, there's a glowing light internally. Even, the, you know, the black headphone is actually a dark tinted plastic. So the, some of the internals light up and there's a little bit of a grill showing um, on the bottom edge of it. And it the grill is a little bit of a nod to automotive and stuff like that. It sort of ducts. It almost looks like it's an intake, like it's sucking in whatever, you know, air, sound waves, whatever whatever it is. Huh. It ducts into the headphone. Uh, and it gives you that curiosity. It's a, it's a little like, this isn't meant to sound crass, this is just a reality. It's a little like cleavage in that it it draws you in. <laughs> it, you know, uh, politically correct or not, it gives you that sense of like almost coming up on your tippy toes or just sort of like, oh, oh my goodness, you know, that's it's attractive and we wanted to give that sense of, of drawing the eye in like i wonder what's under there i want to i want to peek i want to see more you know i crave for more of this so that was the, that was the end goal um and how we ended up with the design yeah cool yeah right it's funny you should talk about irobot because that's one of the things that i sort of uh picked up on looking at some of the your conceptual sketches was uh Maybe not iRobot, but maybe uh, that Bjork video clip, All is Full of Love. Was that ever on your design? Oh, that's you know, funny. Uh, the Chris no, Cunningham one? Hadn't, I know the one you mean, but that, it was not on the mood board, no. Oh, um, totally but that, that, is, that is bang on, actually. Yeah, it's an ex yeah, you know, for a few references there. Um, let's move away from headphones just for now. But you also do some... Uh, Coffee tables, homewares, an interior range. Tell us a bit about that. Yes, this was mostly an accident uh, and stemmed somewhat out of uh, the machining partner, Neil Fay, that we have. Uh, they manufacture for some large uh, furniture firms and they do their own large installation pieces architecturally. And you know, years ago, it always sat in the back of my mind that we had this skill set of them available to us. You know, we partner with them and we, we manufacture a lot with them in Santa Barbara. And the card, the automotive icons tables you're mentioning, were not actually our mm. first furniture. Um, the first, I'm going to call it bespoke, dispo dis common piece, came from a gentleman at Car Week uh, in Pebble Beach. Mm. Um, he had purchased one of our beer bottle openers. And mm -hmm. he was handling the shape of it. And he said, I love this shape. Could you do this? But like, I don't know, like 20 feet long. I'm building a home bar and I'd quite like a bar that's this shape. And I just immediately said yes, without really pondering it through. And, you know, so turned into a four month project of making at the time, I think it was probably a $45,000 bar, which for the amount of machining of it was was actually this. very fair. <laughs> um, wow. And so we made the bar and then he asked us to make his dining table for his family, which is massive. Um, and it was a combo of wood and aluminium. And that sort of suckered me into this, oh man, we could just, we could, we could treat big stuff mm. like a design project. And if there were clients, which there inevitably are in the world that have the budget to use us as a design firm for the thing that they want to make, we actually don't price that stuff as art. Um, we price it as a, as a project, you know, as an engineering yeah, right. project or, or a design project. And it, uh, it's been a really enjoyable part of the business. We did do a series of these 10 automotive icon tables, uh, but we also, uh, have 
done everything from sort of consoles to wet bars. Um, and they're in the Did process. Did you do a table like, for Manny Koshman? And we did do a table for Manny, yes. The, the, Features on his the, Instagram the, very frequently. The giant stealth table that will never, uh, I'll never be able to let down because Manny somehow worded a YouTube video to make it sound like it cost $3 million when it actually Whoa. cost 100000 <laughs> You should have charged more. It's what he insures. I about. sent him a, I did send Manny a text and say, can I send you the bill for the other $2.99 million? <laughs> or $2.9 <laughs> $2. Um I'll just send you uh, a Bugatti but, back. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm massively fond of Manny because he was game for it, and it was, you know, it was an absurd thing. And um, in the middle of the whole thing, he pulled out uh, the middle leg on this 14 foot wide table and decided that the middle of the stealth bomber should essentially float. And we ended up having to use 14, 12 or 14 inch lag bolts into his concrete floor in his garage to stop the thing from tipping over because there was just, wow. you know, a center of gravity away out in front of the yeah, table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. You know, each one of these projects has has a story behind it. We're doing a table for a gentleman right now um, where we made it look like um, we dropped a car engine on top of it yep. uh, and it sank it down into the ground. Uh, so it, instead cool. of, it's like pulled the surface down. And we don't mean this all to be, lots of the stuff isn't car themed, but I'm a car nut and inevitably a lot of my circle is automotive based. Um, you know, and cars are iconic design pieces, so inevitably we sometimes get those sort of drawn into what we're doing. Yeah, really interesting. And and you've, I mean, you've made that very famous table for Manny. I know, sort of, having personally known you over the years, you've done bits and pieces uh, for various celebrities as well. Is there, are there any that you can tell the uh, listeners about, or is it all NDAs and top secret? Um... I have a lot of really scary NDAs, honestly. There's a <laughs> there's a there's a carbon fiber um, poker table on a jet in China that we don't know anything about it. We had to prove that we had destroyed all pictures. That's amazing. Um, and I never met anybody other than the Chinese. I never met anybody other than on a WhatsApp call to a Chinese American person. Um, <gasps> uh, in, you see, I in Asia. That that one was pretty spooky, but it was pretty cool. Um, what what a way to start other, a sentence! Um, but we did. Uh, uh, I, uh, Ryan Reynolds has a razor of ours that looks like um, Deadpool, a straight oh, razor, cool. and I really hoped that it would get used as a weapon uh, to kill somebody, but it didn't. Um, not in real life, uh, in, 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 in a Deadpool wow. movie. <laughs> Andy, that's sure. the uh, that's the pull, that's the 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 highlight quote we're going to take type, out of this yeah. episode. <laughs> That's our trailer, uh, yeah. yeah. We did actually get asked to use our straight razor once in a horror movie, and I looked at the guy's work, and it was beyond it was disturbing. Job? Not on no, it was beyond beyond disturbing, like like low-fi indie stuff that was just oh. creepy. So and when does I, it come out? Yeah, no, we walked away from that real <laughs> fast. <laughs> Um, amazing, there have been amazing. there have been some other bespoke things that we've passed on. Um, there was a non-disclosure agreement I was asked to sign before uh, manufacturing a door uh, for a special room in somebody's house nice. for him and his wife. Sure, sure. Um, and when I was asked to three D scan some areas of her geometry, um, I tossed my hand up in the air and ripcorded out of that one as well and said nope that <laughs> seems like that seems like an occasion where i might end up locked in said room and part of something that i don't want to be part of so wow. 50 shades much, of discommon yeah much <laughs> to disappoint the the listeners we did not execute that one either i'm afraid we'll talk about that uh, uh, later on off air that's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. oh man with stories well the thing that we've been dancing around this whole show is uh, is watches. Now, you're a watch collector, you're a watch enthusiast. You've played around with watch, I guess, redesign or reimagination, um, if, if you will. Neil, what's the collection looking like these days? What's going on with you and watches? Um, do you know, so I've had a I've had a accidental divorce with my collecting passion of watches mm -hmm. during COVID because I haven't um, of course. I haven't really worn watches. And so so let's first touch on um, the 
I just want to mention, just in case, uh, it's it's about 110 degrees in South Carolina right now, and the AC mm-hmm. kicked on in the space that I'm in. I'm in my office, which is a huge old warehouse, so I apologize if it's just become a bit echoey. Uh, but um, watches, for me, are tellers of stories. So they're either mm-hmm. tellers of stories because they're vintage, or they're tellers of stories because of the engineering that they've captured. So... Um, Ilanga is that work uh, or an Ur work or something like that that just captures, you know, years of similar, similar to our duffel bag, you know, captures years of somebody's life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, uh, that was a joke, by the way, uh, our duffel bag is very simplistic in comparison to <laughs> Serrano at Ur works work. <laughs> But it's why I'm fascinated by them as you've captured a lifetime of experience in those things. So um, the collection just now uh, varies from George's work at Bamford Mm -hmm. to I'm currently wearing uh, uh, Chris, the dial artist. I'm wearing his G-Shock. Oh, nice. We've got some of those. The most recent acquisitions were uh, an Artisan de Genève sub. Mm -hmm. Oh, Um, cool. Send us a uh, photo of that, is, please. It's, it's a pretty bummer piece. Um, and uh, oh, what was the one before that? Was a Alaska project. I think you knew about that, Andy. It was a, yes. I actually found a new old stock Alaska project and tore every new old stock part of it off as soon as it arrived and plumped it on my wrist. And it proudly has a scratch. Um, and <laughs> I'm somewhat traumatized myself for that because I, no, I that's good. Just Own it. Have bought a nice one. Yep. Um, uh, and then, you know, centers around vintage hoyer, um, you know, race watches. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Abel Court uh, on restoring stuff. I'm not really a believer that a vintage case has to stay the same um, or has mm-hmm. to stay with all of its marks on it. Some of them mm. do for me, but some of them I just enjoy making them pristine with Abel. And that, that in itself is a lot of fun. And you've done stuff with the Hoya dash clocks, right? And was it Singer, I want to say? Yeah, I don't know that. Well, they haven't released their car yet, but we did. I'm really interested to see if that comes out. Uh, but I, Catherine at, at Hoyer, you know, just because of my love of yep. vintage stuff, she's just just a wicked human. She's just a She's the head of the heritage department, way. right? Or the, the, yes, the correct. historical department, yeah. Just in this business we're in, one of my favorite humans. Um, and um, you know, sharp as attack, passionate, and also knows how to sort of um, corral me and tell me not to get myself in trouble when I try and modify their watches. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I sort of brokered something between the heritage department and Singer to do um, Super Atavias for the DLS, uh, the, cool. the lightweight Singer coming out. But it, it got quite complicated. You know, the Heritage team were going to try and get 40 fully restored um, Super Atavias. It was going to be an option on the car. And, um, you know, it did progress forward. But, I mean, that car has since been in two more years of development. So I'm not sure mm. if that's something that's meant. They didn't need me after the, you know, the, the introductions and the mischief. Um, but a couple of my super Octavia has got grabbed away from me by by contacts or friends that have singers yeah. and they do reside on their dashes very cool very very cool so yeah I'm, I, I do I adore things that tick um, and I'm hunting just now I would um, the next sacrilegious thing that I would like to do is rebody a line of one grand uh, huh. okay so there's a couple rare versions that, you know, one came up at Phillips recently or a year ago that was a steel one. There's, you know, arguably, I think, I hope I don't get this wrong, but there's, you know, three or four steel Langas out there. Mm. And um, all the either Zeitwerks or Langa ones, they're all precious metals. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know if it's because I'm an engineer or because I can't really afford it, but I really think the precious metals are not very good materials for watches. You know, <laughs> they, they, they're either extremely heavy or they like ding really badly or get scratched really badly. So I've just sure. never really understood it other than like a flex of it's made of rose gold. So it's a really bad material for a watch body. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would love to dismantle a, a Lange one and uh, rebody it in machine titanium along with a little bit of uh, design tweakery to the body. So wow. that's, that's a project. S- in sacrilegious, the back of my mind. but it, it sounds amazing. Very I cool. did it to an Otavia. 
Um, yeah. I don't have it on did. just now, but I did rebody in a tabia and titanium, which was quite fun. That's, that's cool. You did, uh, and you did a, uh, it was it black, was it black DLC coded or something? Or black yeah, titanium? that one got me a little bit of trouble. We won't talk about that too much. That ah. got a proper LVMH cease and desist. Nice. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> 17 so, lawyers on CC. <laughs> yeah. So this maybe is maybe the a slightly inopportune time to ask my next question, or maybe it's a good time. Um, sure. you, you know, you've sort of you've you've mentioned sort of working around that watch space in your own capacity. If you went, uh, if you you know had a a list of dream watch clients to you know someone calls you up and says Neil, we want you to be the chief creative lead on our new product. Who would that list include? Laurent Ferrier, because nice. we yep. share a name and I adore his work. Um, he has very, very clean case. So what I would like to design is a case. This is my, my pet peeve or my intrigue with the watch world is that cases are simplistic from a standpoint of that almost all cases out there look like an engineering project. <clears throat> they are lugs with a chamfer around them and a facet on the side. They are not, they don't have nerves um they don't have a complex spline in them anywhere they're generally a process of you know radial machining or casting mm -hmm. or something like that and i feel like automotive design hasn't been brought into cases and mm -hmm. you know one of the reasons you know look at something like a light work um is one of the most astonishing uh movements you know ever created in that top 20 just because of what they achieved with it it's encased in something that's a round circle with a beveled edge and has two, it has four lugs basically, you know, laser welded on. Mm. And a purist might argue, well, that's, that's what it is about Langer, you know, that it's all about the movement. My argument is, yeah, you've never tasked the real, you've never tasked a, you know, a brilliant industrial designer to do something subtle, you know, that so subtle that it's complex, you know. Lines that ever slightly, ever so slightly diverge or have some gentle asymmetry or something like that to them that really surround this in beautiful lines, but don't make it busy. They're just subtle, right? There's a reason that a, a body of an E type or a, you know, a 250 or 275 Ferrari, there's nothing busy or complex about them, but the lines are subtle, so they make it mm. work. Sorry, it's a really long answer for you, but I'd no, love to work with Lauren Ferrier. Um, I would. Max Usser, um, mm -hmm. I'm very proud to call him a mutual friend. We may, we may even, I think he might have respect for what I do, but, but Max <laughs> has, you know, a voice to him. I would very much like to design a case of yours at some point in time. Um, but some of these things are just a little bit more complicated, like when you're friends, you know, I don't really know how we mm -hmm. start that. Is that a business relationship? Is that I should do 20 different designs? Well, I don't mm. know what movements in his head, you know, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, uh, Laurent, um, I love what Langa does, um, MBNF. Uh, Tag is just too big. We've tried, um, you know, showing some work. We've done work for them in the past before and accessories and stuff like that. I don't think, you know, they'll, they'll always have in-house designers and or, you know, a large contracted firm. Um, I don't know that we'd ever get to do it with them, uh, but yeah, those are those are kind of my current it's a good passions list. that I enjoy. It's a good roster, Neil. What I find interesting is the artisans de, de Genève, um, because the amount of detail and work that goes into, um, you know, these the submarine that you have, for example, is quite extraordinary. And someone like yourself making a purchase like that, because you know they're not they're not cheap and, and i mean multiples and multiples of the retail price but obviously someone like yourself can can appreciate the amount of effort and thoughtfulness that goes into it just um, it just melted my brain um that's all you know it, it, they are artisans um mm. and what they did is incredible and sorry i probably should add them to the list as well um i'd love to these are these are cool cool can I just enjoy George Bamford a lot. And so I realized that, that Artisans is in a little bit of the space that he was obviously originally in with Rolexes. Mm -hmm. I will work on a project with George at some point in time just because he and I have a riot together. Um, uh, but Artisans just, again, like we have a deep background in machining. 
Mm-hmm. And I do feel like I would love to do a case with them because we could we could elevate. That would that would be really fun. But I didn't purchase it from them. Their list, they, it was a mutual friend that, that has a collection of watches. Um, and I, um, he has some astonishing watches. And this was more of a sport purchase for him, let's call it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just chased them and chased them and chased them, essentially. Um, Did you swap them cool. a duffel bag? <laughs> No, uh, so we, we have a yeah. <laughs> we have a remarkably um, we have a remarkably complicated um, and hilarious relationship. We co-own a car. Um, he has, I don't think I've technically paid him for the watch, um, but there is a car. In case you watch listening, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, there is a car that I that's in my garage right now that I'm selling that I'm not entirely ah, sure that we know who exactly yeah, owns, yeah. owns it, and yeah, it's. <laughs> So he and I were just sort of, we just, you know, go on adventures together of things. So um, this is one that I just harassed him for long enough um, uh, that, that it is in my watch collection right now. But I will tell you that, you know, similar to, to when I did his light work, it was something that I purchased um, with great fear, mm-hmm. massive gulp, you know, huge amount of money, but I also felt like um, secure asset. I don't really do anything with the stock market. I don't understand mm. it. It scares me. I feel like other companies are inefficient and I, I don't know what they're going to do. And I have often played around with, with assets, which um, uh, requires a lot of conversations with my wife that, that are like, babe, I promise, I, th- I think I'm feeling okay about this. Um, but I do wear it all. The cars get driven very hard. Um, but I've made good decisions with vehicles as well, where you know, if you buy things that you think might go on trend or that are increasing in value, it makes a lot of people wouldn't bat an eyelid about spending $56,000 on a Volvo XC90 that it would immediately be worth 35 grand, you know, as soon as they've like it aside and everything. Well, I've, I've taken a lot of deep breaths and I'm a lot more prone to spend Seventy-five thousand dollars on a vehicle that I think might be ninety-five in two years. Yeah, sure. Um, the smart place. What I want to ask you while we are talking about watches. So obviously you've, you're a, a tinkerer and uh, obviously very creative, but you're also very passionate about watches. What are the or what particular difficulties do you kind of see from that technical point of view? within the watch designs and around cases and where do you want to kind of push that? What ideas do you have around, you know, this common case? Well, um, we have a this common watch design. Um, it's not made yet. Um, it would probably retail at 1500 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a manual wind. Um, it's keeps, keeps it clean and simple. Um, it's going to use a decorated manual wind. Uh, I feel like you should interact with objects, enjoy manual winds. You know, mm-hmm. I think the art of winding it up is a special thing. Um, and we just spent a long time on, if you look at the top view of that watch, it, there are harkings to the top silhouette of a 911. Not that it looks like a watch, for, not like it looks like a car from the top, but the, the top shoulders of it are ever so slightly wider, a little bit like a bullhead omega. Um, and then it has converging and diverging lines on the sides that are, you know, they're not first glance. It looks symmetrical. It's not symmetrical. And there are areas of it that will need a fourth axis to machine. Um, and it will be a slightly more expensive part to machine. At the end of the day, is just a part. Um, and that doesn't work as well for folks like Tag Heuer that, you know, are essentially stamping out blanks and trimming the mm. CNC machine to get a you know, mass produced piece. Um, so I just would want to spend time with surfaces, creases, and you know the way that light catches edges. Very that's, cool. That's my very, very statement cool. of design on it. I yeah. like it. I like it. Last thing, last thing to which we we have to mention, and I, I think we had a great opportunity to bring it up earlier, but we didn't. You've been doing some remarkable work outside of luxury goods, watches, tables, furniture. Uh, vehicles and you've you've been pr- quite busy over the last six months i want to say in the ppe space um, oh my goodness yeah <laughs> uh, I, have this, getting... I have a gray patch in my beard that i'm calling my covid patch it's wow literally gray hair from it <laughs> so it's just new yeah i earned it over the past six months 
yeah, I think it's pretty remarkable and it was sort of really nice uh, for, for Felix and I to see you sort of step up really, really early on and use your particular set of skills, uh, let's call them, to, you know, identify manufacturers and work out this crazy supply chain, which I think you bullied uh, FedEx or one of the American airlines into giving you a plane to fly uh, all of uh, well, it was actually it was actually Boeing. Um, Boeing oh, gave us the yeah, biggest right. plane they make. Yes, <laughs> uh, they were just like, "Don't at me." Discount. Oh yeah, it was like, just, a, was um, it a like their Dreamlifter or something ridiculous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a Dreamlifter. It was it was the most. I cried at that one. I'll give you that. Like that that was one of the most emotional work things I've ever seen. That land at Greenville Spartanburg Airport GSP, um, which has like five gates. Um, I mean, every single employee was there, you know, like it, it, that was wild. Like, I can't believe this company did this to help. Um, it, it has been a crazy six months. So, so I found out about the problem. We, we tried to donate some masks, a, a pitiful amount now understanding the scope of the problem uh, mm. to our local hospital system. I thought they were just our local hospital. Turns out they are the whole of South Carolina. Um, they start to call my bluff on like, where do you think you're going to get these? And I explained what we do, that we actually manufacture some accessories just now for a medical firm. Um, and that I really understand this chain of things and what's going wrong with supply right now. Um, and I tapped um, both our logistics firm that we use for these medical products and also a client and friend of ours, Casemate, their cell phone case company. And I know that like on a weekly basis, they move 10 tons plus of product out of the south of China um, mm. here and um, talk to their CEO and, and um, we're now business partners in PPE. But uh, I said, I need some of your I need some of your air freight space. I need guaranteed space out of China. Like we need it. We need to hit this with a baseball bat. And it was wild. I can't remember all of the details and what happened. It's just this crazy blur. I mean, it genuinely could be April just now for me still. Um, we were doing probably 18 hours a day, most of it Asia time. I've sent 40 foot containers on river boats to get them to Hong Kong to meet airplanes and all sorts of stuff. And hmm. but what a joy to you know, design went on hold. You know, our clients in Europe stopped, they shut down. Um, clients cut retainers, you know, all of those types of things. It was a you know, global recession. Hmm. Um, and I just thought, well, we can we can divert and use a skill set. And, and anyway, all of a sudden we landed like a lot in Greenville and people realized, oh my goodness, they're not full of it. You know, there's so much misinformation going on with PPE right now. It's just horrific. Mm. And there's people making billions of dollars yeah. um, doing yeah, right. really, really wrong things. Uh, and and I just said, we, we come on, like, we can do this. This is the, All this requires is logic, you know? Um, factory people in China that can inspect the factory, check the factory. We can vet them. Then it requires logistics. Um, after you've got logistics, you know it requires the clients, good quality control, and sort of explaining to people that you can get stuff here. And it's been a, a heck of a party, and it's been pretty honestly traumatic seeing. There's a lot of political stuff going on. Mm. Um, our country did handle PPE very badly. Um, we weren't ready. I don't even think that's a debatable point. Um, and it was a lot of individuals that actually worked together to do stuff. And I saw just, I saw some pretty, pretty bad elements of humanity of these people. I remember one guy telling me, oh, come on, we can do this deal. It's like 12 Ferraris. And I just hung up the phone on him. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, they call them bad actors in the military, mm. but a lot of bad actors out there. Uh, but, but a lot of just incredible people dumping and our local FedEx International guy was, he was beside me through the whole thing, figuring out, you know, customs forms and how to do things correctly for the FDA. And it was, mm. it, it was wicked. Amazing. Well, Neil, good on you. Uh, really, really nice to see um, the effort that you made when a lot of people weren't doing it. Uh, I think we haven't even scraped the surface of uh, of Neil and this this common story, so we might have to um, we might have to get you back for for part two because if people uh, head over to your Instagram at discommon, uh, you'll see things like cars and duffel bags and sneakers and more furniture in the way of uh, chairs and. I just blabber a lot. I'm really this. sorry. I talk. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's, it's all very fascinating and super interesting. It's just uh, we want to. 
well, we're going to have to bait you to come back on a second time, but also leave a little bit for that discussion. Um, wallets, uh, whiskey. We glasses, should probably talk about furniture whiskey. sometime more. That would be that would be enjoyable. We we uh, uh, we're thinking a lot about furniture these days, and yes, probably yeah. because of staying at home all the time. So we we can touch on that one day. A hundred percent. Thank you so much for coming on. And at, like we said, that's at Discommon and we'll link up your website and we'll link up uh, your socials, but Discommon.com. Uh, Felix, anything to wrap? Uh, I don't know if we've uh, if we've prepped this with Neil, Andy, but um, I suspect I know the answer given the story of your COVID grey patch. But is there anything you've been doing or enjoying uh, that's not work-related at the moment that you would recommend to, to us or to listeners? Listening, reading, watching. Um, I have not done enough self care in the past six months. I have yeah. maintained exercise, uh-huh. um, which my one comment is that throughout all of this, I feel like exercise should be treated as the most important business meeting that you can ever have. Have that's mm-hmm. just sure. one of the things that I, I lead uh, my life around. Um, but no, I, I actually, so funnily enough, I did just take apart my first watch uh, yeah. into all of its pieces and I'd never done that. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I do feel like this should be the time to learn a new skill, but I also feel like a fraud saying that to any listener because I sort of hid from COVID by working. Um, uh, and uh I'm going to carry some guilt for that. You know, I think I think a lot of the world, um, it, depending on your viewpoint, if you're cut half full, they got offered a reset um, with a lot of trauma attached and jobs and all that. I, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. But, you know, uh, there is going to be a new world coming out of this where I have a number of friends moving out of cities, valuing their family time more, talking to me about co-working spaces and, you know, doing their own thing and that type of stuff. And I, I, I'm, I'm very just much enjoying i've done a lot of facetimes and video calls with friends and um we have a kings of quarantine workout group where we all meet on zoom um, nice. and it's it's been startling it's had everybody from steph curry basketball player was on it one day through to musicians mm-hmm. and all sorts of people and, and they've been a huge inspiration to this so very yeah exercise um and i would just say connecting with friends and talking to folks that you know you respect and miss and realizing you miss them it's yeah. very nice of you to say neil <laughs> yeah you guys I, you guys will do as well <laughs> <laughs> and look and i think i just like refute it sounds like you haven't been uh, overlooking the self-care aspect at all i think that's sort of the definition of it really so that's um a really you know i think a good and important recommendation um so yeah thank you for finding the time on a whatever sunday afternoon there sunday um, on a afternoon. sunday yep at yeah. this common, uh, but don't worry, he's always listening and watching because he might be CIA. You never know. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> he, and he right, can't tell he... us because of the paperwork. Yeah. So, Andy, we've just got off the phone to Neil, who is, I think, we can both agree, genuinely cool. Some people he's like one of the coolest tip- guys I know. Some people like, hey, he's a cool guy. Neil, he's just, he doesn't try. He is. he lets his actions do the talking. Like he's just, he's not trying to be cool. He's just. He's, he's cool with yeah, everything that he does. That's literally what I just said, Andy. <laughs> you cut out a little bit, Felix? Oh, oh sure. Oh, be cool, okay. man. Be, okay. cool. be cool. He's Felix. cooler than us combined. Um, he lets his actions do the talking, um, as Felix said. Credit to Felix from moments ago. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to Major Tom Media. Felix, if how do they email wanna, us? If you want to tell us how cool we are, you can email us at otthepodcast at gmail.com. You can DM us about our coolness at ot.podcast on Instagram. You can express your appreciation for our coolness by buying some of our hilarious decals from the uh, website, which is linked in the description of the podcast you're listening to. Uh, you know, thanks as always to Major Tom Media. Did we do that already, Andy? We, yes. We'll do it twice. You need to be Thank you twice. Often. People and three times. And thank you to our sponsors, as always. We did that as well. <laughs> I think it's time we go, Andy. It's, it's, it's time to hit stop recording. Let's do it.